This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans. Danilo's free. And he goes to get one. Danilo! First time we've seen them attack them. And there's Brandon! Well, that's what I've wanted to see Robinson do. Tyler Wadi he scores! And the sticky ground! Hello and welcome back to the Red Side of the Trent podcast after enduring yet another international break, which did see England and Scotland qualify for the Euros next summer from the home nations. This is the fan preview, which we welcome, where we welcome an opposition fan to give an insight to their club. And we are delighted to be joined by Billy Mully from the Oak Road Hatter podcast. Thanks for your time, Billy. Are you well? I'm all good, yeah, as you say, uh, England, Scotland, all through to, to the Euros, um, exciting times, but more exciting times for us to uh, talk about Premier League football once again. Yeah, uh, a weird, weird question, but one I think that is quite relevant is, do you welcome the international breaks now that Luton are in the Premier League, or you kind of like want the games to keep coming thick and fast like they do in the Championship, Dre, you, you can play like... Tuesday or Wednesday and play Saturday and you kind of get over the hump almost of of a defeat or whatever quite quickly if if you're doing pretty well, would you say? Yeah, I, I like the championship schedule. I know the players probably wouldn't agree with that given um, that it's 46 league games and then that's, that's without even considering cup and, and um, other bits of action. So, yeah, Luton grew a real good reputation of bouncing back after disappointment. Um, and, and I guess the shorter the break was, the, the better we'd done. So now having a week after, you know, two defeats in a row, it's starting to pile up and it's not the not the good feeling we could have where we could put it right, say, in three or four days when we had a, a Tuesday, Wednesday fixture. But yeah, I guess for the players' well-being, I, I guess it does help out. And from a tactical perspective as well, it... it gives Rob the, the time to prepare the players, especially because we're, we're in the midst changing formation at the moment. So I think that's probably ideal, the fact that we're having three international breaks before Christmas. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be more of an ignorance thing from from my perspective, but because I don't know how many internationals Luton have on their books. But like you said, is, is, it, is it a good, good training ground time for for rob edwards then really because you might not have so many going away but you can correct me if i'm wrong there would you is that is that kind of a good thing would would you say yeah it's it's i guess half and half really because naturally being in the premier league um we've got more internationals now with with you know ogbene who we signed from rotherham uh play for ireland we had uh Kaboro play for burkina faso um and we've had Tom Lockyer as well um, and, and Kaminsky out with Wales and uh, Belgium, respectively. So we've, there's a few players out on international break. And I guess those players that are left behind are having their holidays and they're all sort of coming back together at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think, as I mentioned before, the, this notion of changing formation, I think it's probably been worthwhile having this extended period of time where, where Rob can really drill in these new roles to, to play as he wants. Yeah, we'll get onto the formation thing a little bit later. I mean, from, from a Forest perspective, we, we kind of, I think the break come out a bit of a wrong time because we're trying to change the style of play and kind of formation. And like against Crystal Palace, we looked nearly there. And then like you have a two week break and you kind of go, oh, but they're not like majority of the team are going. So it's kind of hard to like get it into place again. But are you enjoying the Premier League so far? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess the picture probably looks a little bit worse, four points from eight games, but just going to all these different grounds, um, you know, even the, the, the first two were Brighton and Chelsea, just really, really positive away days. The sun shining, playing Premier League football, um, admittedly lost both games 4-1 or 3-0. But yeah, it's been it's been really exciting going to all these places and, you know, deserving to be here as well. It, it, it's been a really exciting time so far, but I think the 
the feeling is is that we've been really competitive so as good this time has been to adapt to the premier league and go to all these places we're starting to really believe that something something good can happen this season i don't think you like too dissimilar to what we were like last season except we made 30 signings as it was well documented but what 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 were the differences have you seen from last season to this season like what's been like stuck out like a sore thumb for you in the comparison of leagues the biggest thing I think, and uh, it's something that Rob Edwards has spoken about loads already, is is the um, it's how important both boxes can be. Last season, we were happy to give teams the ball, and we were we were, you know, mastered counter attacking really to perfection at points. Um, but if you give a Premier League club a lot of the ball, they'll they'll carve out chances no matter which Premier Le- uh, Premier League club you're talking about. So that's been uh, somewhat of an adaptation process and we haven't been as quite as clinical as we probably were last season. Um, we've created a lot more chances, which is weird to say. We've created more chances being being a um, Premier League club compared to a championship side, but they're not quite going in at the moment. And yeah, I think if we can master that, I think we could be on for something good. I think I remember seeing Rob Edwards say as well about the, the pace of the game is done. Everything is done so much faster. And I noticed that definitely last season, it was ridiculous. Like everyone's at 100 miles per hour, even the team at the bottom of the league, like the bottom of the league fighting with you are the same at the top, but you've played quite a lot of different sort of sides. You've played Everton, you've played Wolves, and then you've played Brighton and Chelsea. So it's been a bit of a mix for you really in that sense. But what mindset has Luton fans got for this season? Because obviously the, the narrative is that you're going to be the whipping boys of the league almost. I mean, I think that's quite harsh in in a way because you're here on merit, as 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 every club is. But what what's the general feeling amongst the supporters? I think it's twofold. I think it's enjoy the rides because quite evidently a lot of people predict us to to finish rock bottom or or to be relegated, and that, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But I think from what we've seen, bar the the Chelsea and Brighton games at the very start of the season, we have been very competitive. We've either lost by a goal, we've drawn or we've won. So we've learned quickly. I think we're learning our mistakes quickly. Um, but at the same time, just enjoy every every away day, every big team that you welcome to Kenworth Road. Just just lap it up because who knows, it could be a while till we're back. But at the same time, the fact that we have been so competitive, I think that ups expectations and standards really. Um, so it's quite hard to juggle being a Luton fan and, and having this expectation that we will go down, but also showing really positive glimpses. What, what have you made of the season so far? Eight games in, four points. I mean, it's it's not it's not a ho- horrible return. You're not in the relegation zone, so it's it's positive in that respect, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, as I said, the first two games were quite difficult. Um, deservedly getting beat by by three goals in both games. And then from then on, we have been competitive. Um, take the, There's been a couple of games where we've deserved more than, than what we've actually got. I look back to the Wolves game where they went down to 10 men in the first half and we created a fair few chances, enough to win the game, but, but couldn't really capitalise on that. Against Fulham, we lost 1-0 at their place and again created three like, golden chances, but we couldn't really take. Um, and then the latest one against Spurs. Spurs are top of the league and absolutely flying. But when a player gets sent off in the first half, you're at Kenilworth Road. You really want to be taking advantage of that, and we we couldn't, didn't really create anything either, which was a little bit of a, a little bit of a concern. But you know, it's it's been positive. Um, we've noticed as well as Luton fans that any little mistakes punished in the Premier League, any laps of concentration can be capitalised on and keeping concentration for, for 90 minutes is is difficult enough um, in a in any world of work. But when you're a footballer in the Premier League, it's completely different. Yeah, I mean, the Spurs game, I didn't watch, but I heard Spurs were unfortunate not to be a, f- a fair few goals up before, before the sending off. So it's kind of, it's one of them, isn't it? You've got to take your chances, obviously. But what's been an annoying narrative about Luton this season, other than the whole you're not going to stay up? And, 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 and is there anything that kind of sticks out to your mind, like what maybe a pundit said that you you just don't disagree with like at all? 
Oh, 100%. Um, I think any comment that, that thinks Luton will, will come bottom, that's absolutely fine. We, where we finished third, we came up through the playoffs. We haven't spent much money. Um, I think all Luton fans understand that that's the expectation. That's the tag that's been given. But where I think it was Garth Crooks, BBC pundit, um, basically insinuated that we're not even trying. We're not even giving the Premier League a go. And we're just taking the money and running, which just a load of rubbish, really. Um, we've had a set way of doing things. We've done it in the Championship. We had bottom six budget last season, got promoted. Um We've spent a bit of money, 20 million around that kind of figure, which for us is a sizable fee, especially when when a lot of it's going to fund a new stadium. But we've brought in quality players, um, players that are of a good age that will progress into Premier League players. Um, and the objective isn't just the end of this season. The objective is looking, you know, two, three, four years down the line and making sure we've got a squad that, Either we can sell on for for big enough fees, or they can be a big part of our future. It's it's really funny because we kind of both come into the league in the same sort of way, where both come through the playoffs. So you get that. And then last last season was really was crazy because of the gap because of the World Cup. So as 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 you probably know as well, even though you had a bit longer, it's still quite difficult to catch up almost. And then we're like the opposite ends of the scale because Luton weren't expected to spend loads of money and you're getting accused of, oh, you're not trying hard enough. And then we spent quite a lot of money, bought a lot of players in and everyone's going, well, this is ridiculous. And then, but no one's actually saying, well, at least Forrest are having a go. Do you know what I mean? It's really like chalk and cheese of the media. I find that like they try and find something that will get all the clicks in, in my opinion. But I think... From a neutral perspective, I think Luton have done it the right way, bringing in those, like you say, young players like Tahith Chong. Uh, I'm trying to think who else you've brought in. You might be able to fill the gaps in here. Uh, I know you brought Marvellous Nakamba back. He was on loan to you last season. But yeah. you're bringing in players that, if you do go back down, they, they, the squad's going to be good enough to go back up, you'd like to think. And then, like you say, build and then maybe stay in the Premier League the next time you get the money come in or whatever and you've got your new stadium and and then etc i don't know what you want to ch chip in with there yeah you've you've summed it up perfectly um i think all luton fans are aware that the premier league is a massive massive step up in quality um and if we were to splash the cash and us splashing the cash would have probably been double what we what we actually spent which would probably be around the 40 45 million pound mark and if we've done that, that that has to be deemed as a risk and then if you do go down, then you've spent a lot of money and you're having to, you know, fill in the gaps as it were. So I think we've done it the right way. It's OK if we get relegated because we've set ourselves up so well uh, with, the, with the quality we've brought in. And we will have a squad that's, you know, competed in the Premier League. If we, if we you know, end the season, um, play the 30, 30 more games that there are and be as competitive as we have been, I'm sure every Luton fan will be will be proud of what we've displayed, and I, I guess we would have proven some people wrong that we have been competitive and we're not just a laughing stock. Out of the new boys you brought in, who's probably been the most impressive for you? Has to be a Bene uh, Chidozi Bene. We, we've got such a impressive track record of free transfers. Um, you look at our squad at the moment. Um, got Tom Lockyer. Uh, on a free, we got Reese Burke, another starting centre back, on a free. Ogbené on a free. Jordan Clark, who's injured at the moment but still a quality player, on a free. Um, and Ogbené was at Rotherham last season and you know, had a very good season, but still somewhat of an unknown quantity. Playing for playing for Rotherham, you don't get the recognition as you would do for you know a bigger club in the Championship. And so we picked him up. I expected him to be a sort of a rotation player. But he's just made that left wing position his own. And I spoke about changing formation where he's single handedly forced Rob Edwards into changing formation to play with wingers. And he's what he's picked up the man of the match award in every game in the last four or five. So he's taken to Premier League football like a duck to water. And it's just so exciting to see how far he can go. Yeah, I saw his uh, name pop up quite a lot for Rotherham last season. Was he their top scorer? 
or or not. But I was quite surprised he's gone for free, which is just credit to you guys, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, had a I think back in January before before we picked him up in the summer, there was a lot of talk about which club was going to get him. Luton were linked with him, but I just thought we don't have a chance here unless we are a Premier League club. And unfortunately we were the only only top flight side that, that wanted to take a punt on him and and it's it's a decision that's taken us miles because he has been absolutely superb. I mean, it's it's a win-win because you're getting him for free. He's going to get a lot of exposure in the Premier League and experience and that. So it's it's really no risk. And it's quite funny that you say about free signings because Forrest have made two in the last two seasons, one being Serge Ori. I mean, completely opposite end of the scale. I mean, guys played Champions League final and captain of Ivory Coast. He's coming for free last season. Everyone kind of... I was like, what the heck are we doing? And then he was probably one of our player of the seasons last year. And then equally, we've brought in Olaena, who was at Chelsea as a kid, was at Fulham at one point, free from Torino. And he's been really good. So you can't knock a free signing, really, as long as the the research has been done. But I I, I did want to speak about Carlton Morris because he's probably been your man that's from the squad from last season who's continued that progression almost because I, lo- I had a look at his uh, track record and he didn't really score loads and loads of goals and even at Barnsley when he probably got a bit more attention in League One didn't score as many goals as he did last season but he seems to have kind of relished the Premier League as well that especially being such a physical striker yeah, it was a weird one when we brought him in um, ahead of our, our promotion winning season because not many expected us to to bring in another striker at that point it looked like the the forward department had, had been filled but he came in as our record signing at, at sort of two million pounds which you know us as a championship club not really spending money raised a couple of eyebrows thinking what's going on here but yeah what he's been able to produce in the championship and stepping up to the premier league is just the perfect fit of the style of play um holds the ball up so well, uh, ball sticks to him. And that's something that's not been lost in the Premier League, which is quite impressive to see. He's he's taken the Premier League very well. And regardless of if he's playing as part of a two, if he's playing as part of a forward three, he's, you know, he's a very consistent player that, that puts in display after display. And yeah, it's been impressive. And I, I, I think there's even more gears. I think there's even more to come from him. He probably hasn't been as productive in the final third as, as we, us Luton fans would have liked so far. Um, a couple of penalty goals. And I think it's the one from open play against Everton. But yeah, he's showing positive signs in his, in his all-around play. Um, and then having Bene next to him as well. I'm sure that that partnership's only going to blossom. Yeah, I mean, the game against Everton, I remember watching it on Match of the Day and I think I, don't, I remember Everton probably being a big coupon buster that day. But the defending is abysmal, but the finish from from Morris is, is sublime, really, like straight on the volley, like bottom corner and Pickford had no chance. But I mean, another story, obviously, is Tom Lockyer because he scored in that game, be it a bit unusual in terms of closing down Ashley Young, I think it is on the goal line, but... For someone who did he collapse? Was it the playoff final he collapsed, or was it another game? And then he has he got now uh, a defibrillator or a, I can't get me words out now. Pacemaker now is that, is that right? Or might you might be able to fill me in there? I don't know if it's a pacemaker. I know he had to have minor surgery in the end. I don't know if it was actually a pacemaker, but yeah, it was. That was from that moment of collapsing. Um, recovery and coming into the Premier League he's, he's done brilliantly um, yeah it was such a weird time that that playoff final because you just seen him drop and it was just it, it was just a very worrying concerning moment because there was no one around him and you, your mind starts going back to you know Ericsson um, during the Euros or yeah it was the Euros. yeah it was the Euros you start really panicking about what that could mean but but recovered so well um, put through his paces in pre-season, came through every test with flying colours. And then, yeah, in the Premier League now, um, been done up for pace a couple of times, but <laughs> for, for his size, he doesn't look the most physical, but he wins duel after duel and he steps into play and, and makes interceptions, clearances, absolutely everything that you want from, from a defender. So, 
he's making he, he like um Morris he is adapting to the Premier League very well and you know I, I keep forgetting that we're eight games in it's still very new to a lot of these players and and the way we have adapted it, it's been quite impressive yeah, I think it's the same with with us last season. Like players like Warrell and Yates stepping up, you kind of wonder, are they going to do it? And then before you know it, give them half a season and they kind of adjust to the speed and how people run and, and et cetera. I mean, it will be an interesting battle between Tom Lockyer and whoever plays up front for Forrest, whether that's if a one who's back from injury or Chris Wood or a, a Divock Origi. I mean, that's some some kind of... Uh, that's a bit different for all of them, really. But for those who haven't watched Luton, maybe in the last, I'd say, 18 months, because I I wanted to watch the, the championship whilst I was in the Premier League with, with zero pressure, and that didn't happen at all. So I can't really vouch for how you play. And I've not watched... I watched the game against Chelsea, and I thought you was actually quite unlucky before they went 2-0 up, to be honest. I thought I thought you gave them a really good game. So how how would you describe your style of play and, and what are your main strengths? I still say like um, what you probably remember from the championship when we played you, we, we're still quite direct. Um, I think we're lowest in the division for possession. Um, when you've got someone like Morris and we started the season, we've had a bio up top as well. Um, you have to play to your strengths. You have to play to, to what got you into the Premier League. And yeah, we, we still go quite direct. A lot of diagonals but we're also quite incisive and productive around the final third. Um, something that I think Rob Edwards really wanted to knuckle down on during during pre-season. I think we've seen that so far. We're also probably, depending on personnel, um, we attack down the left more than the right when we've got Alfie Dowerty and, and Ogbené on that left-hand side. Um, you know, I know we're in the Premier League and I know we're talking about some of the best combinations, but that combination is, is starting to, to really, really blossom. And they had good fortune against Wolves, had good fortune against um, even Tottenham as well. Those two together, really, really impressive. And yeah, obviously, new sign in, in Andros Townsend, whether he plays a part, that could change the dynamic, that could change um, the way we attack down the right. There's a lot of different combinations now. I think in the championship, there was one way we could play and we didn't really deviate from that at all. Whereas now there's different formations, different systems, different combinations that, that we can use. And it makes us a little bit more unpredictable. Um, but at the same time, um, you have to understand the quality you're coming up against in the Premier League. Yeah, for me, I think I didn't, I didn't predict Luton to come bottom. I did. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to lie to you. I'd predict you to come in the bottom three. I actually predict Sheffield United to come bottom because I think they're abysmal. But I, I think with Luton and the personnel you've got, I mean, we've not even mentioned Mpanzo. I mean, the guys come up from the National League all the way to the Premier League is sensational. What a story! I mean, I hope they make a documentary about him. The, the Beckham ones doing the rounds, get get in one because that is that is ridiculous, really. Like, what a story! But I think you've got characters in the dressing room where you will dig in and you will make it horrible for teams similar to how we did last season where you, you don't play the pretty football, but you get results. And I think that's what inevitably, if you've got, if you've, that will give you the chance to stay up and that will really piss off a lot of people in the Premier League. So I'm all for it in a sense, although I do think Luton are a bit of a bogey side for Forrest. I'd rather you not, I'd rather not play here as well at the same time. It's a bit of a strange one for me, but what, what would you say your weaknesses are have been in, in those, several games where you've maybe not got a result or got maybe a bit of a hammer in? For, for me, and I, I don't know if I speak for, for the whole Luton fan base here, but I still think we should be creating more. I think we get ourselves into good positions, um, especially down that left side with, with Ogbené and how he started. Um, but I think we could be a bit more cute, a little bit more creative in that final third to... to actually generate chances rather than just good positions. That's probably the the one thing I'd go to from an attacking sense. From a defensive point of view, individual er errors, um, that was more prominent at the start of the season. It seems to, to have been getting better. Um, but you just look at the Spurs goal that they scored where they took a short corner. Madison um, quite easily beats his man and, and you know, we're 1-0 down. 
it's just little things like that. It's just brief moments where either concentration's lacking or just as a whole, we're we're switched off and you just can't do that. You can't do that at this level of football. Yeah, it's decision making as well, isn't it? It's just brief, such a ruthless division in, in, in all honesty. But do Luton fans see this as a fixture that you can get something from? Yeah, yeah, I do. And there's been this narrative this season about our Luton's only chance of getting points will be Kenilworth Road, where I'd actually flip that. I, I think we're still a better side that Forrest will have to come and play us. Forrest will have to, there'll be more of a, um, there'll be more pressure on Forrest to impose themselves on us. And I think that might, that might um, play into our hands. I still think Forrest is an incredible side now. I think you're progressing so, so well. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate them at, at, at any cost. But I think if we are to get something, that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to dig in deep. We're going to have to break well. Um, and we've seen in glimpses when we are pressed um, and we have to play with width and we have to play quickly, we do create some of our better chances. So I think, yeah, we have to allow for us to control the game from a possession point of view, but we also have to be quick, accurate and, and just all around um, really positive when those chances to break um, occur. Yeah, I was going to say, I think your record away from home last season was better than the one at home. So, yeah, I don't know why everyone kind of refers to that. I actually think you'll be better away from home this season as well, just because I don't think they'll, the pressure will be on. I mean, like you said, the emphasis is on Forrest to take control of the game. And and I would say the whole stadium will, will be thinking the same thing if we don't take the game to you and kind of sit back. It's probably be a bit of a disappointment almost unless like it kind of dangles a carrot to say come on you can come out you show a little bit and then and then we kind of I don't know goose you a little bit but what's your thoughts been on Forest so far this season if you've managed to watch anything match of the day or, or whatever I've been, I've been really impressed I think looking at where you were as a club when you got promoted um, I think you were similar to us obviously it was the playoffs that you went through um, there were there was a better side in Fulham that I think went up that season, um, but I think you've bridged that gap really really well. Of course, a lot of signings during the first season, some adapted very well, some of course didn't. But I think you've now got you're reaping the rewards of that. You've got a very settled squad. You've got players um, that under the, the relationships between um, different members of the squad really really strong. Um, and I think you're, you're reaping the rewards of, you know, being flexible as well. You've got players like Hudson Adoy, who I think was it against Chelsea where he just ripped them apart on a couple of occasions. And you just look at that and think, what a player to, to be able to get into your club. And um, but you've also got that metal. You've also got that, you know, Joe Worrell. I don't know if McKenna's played much at the start of the he, season. He played, at the, he played at the start and then he's been he's at, he's had his place in it by a young Brazilian lad called Morello, who's I don't think we'll keep him for very long, to be honest. He looks too good already. Yeah. Yeah, but it looks like you've got flexibility. Um you can attack teams, you can break teams down, but you've also got that steel in you, which I think will serve you well against the better clubs. And you know, when you have played, you've played Chelsea, you've played City, you've played, played Arsenal, Arsenal, Man United. Yeah, yeah. We played, so you've had we a played, we played, we played Liverpool next week away from home. They, I don't know who did this fixture list, uh, Bill, <laughs> but I, I, well, we're investigating Derby fans. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you've you've proven that you can adapt, not necessarily adapt your game style, but you can acclimatise to any different challenge. And I think that that's such an underrated uh, trait in the Premier League to. Be able to perform in different ways against different um opposition i think that's that's going to serve you well and i think that's key to why i think you will finish closer to the top 10 than you will to the the sort of bottom six mm. yeah it's going to be an interesting season as it as it progresses obviously especially for this change of style but if we line up in a 4-3-3 which we have done in the last couple of games who who do you fear and and kind of where do you think the key battles lie? Um, I think you mentioned it at the start, uh, Lockyer or Anderson, whoever starts out the two of our centre-backs against um, 
either if it's Origi, if it's Gibbs White will play on the left, won't he? Or just behind. he might play. On, he played. He played on the right at Crystal Palace just before as a as like a he'd, he'd like come in inside and or hang out wide because we're playing free in central midfield and we're trying to dominate the ball a little bit more. So it's yeah. like kind of shoehorning him in, but trying to still get the best out of him, which is it's difficult because he's not the he's not actually like rapid, if you know what I mean. He's not a winger quick. He's quick in, in small spaces. So it's a bit strange really playing him out wide, but you kind of can't play you can't not play him. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. Um and then I always butcher his name, but obviously our knee we Yeah, I wouldn't you. I mean, you, yeah. if, he's, if he's fit, because he's been, he was in, he's been injured, so I don't know if you'll play or not. It's, it's not not said anything yet. So. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think you have the potential to dominate us centrally, and if yeah. that is Gibbs White coming off from from the left or the right, um, but I think for us, um, I think the left hand side could be again massive, depending on on who starts. If it's Doughty and Ogbené. I think again we'll, we'll try and shift our focus to, to that kind of side, and if it's if Aurier, is he starting at the moment? He did, he did, he did uh, against Palace, yeah, yeah. So obviously he's very experienced. He's a player that reads the game very well, but he's also not afraid to get forward and and really pin Ogbené back. I think that would be a really interesting battle, um, and then yeah, it'll be interesting to see if any of the sort of uh, well, Townsend or Barkley, if any of them play a part. Um, Barkley's been getting back to fitness. Obviously, Townsend's just come in. Uh, a bit of Premier League experience for us, which we've been pretty shy of so far. Um, I think that could be interesting to see what that could do to the game, depending on what the score is going into sort of the final 15 minutes. Um I've been I've been confident all this season, and um, that, that means seventy five percent of the time I've been I've been wrong because it's ended in defeat. But yeah, I've been spirited by what I've seen. I mean, Luton in the pre- Premier League. I don't think you'd ever utter them words. So may you be optimistic as you like. I think I was the same last season because it was the first time in my. I mean, Forest were in the Premier League when I was a kid, so I don't even really remember it. Let's be honest. So this is like my my time of of enjoying of enjoying that but you talked about a change in formation i know you used to play like a 3-4-3 three, three kind of thing before or 3-2-1 you can correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure you played with wing backs before what what's changed then since and and obviously you, you mentioned ogbené making that change because he's been so effective yeah so we started the season 3-5-2 or a 5-1-2-2 so we had yeah, the, the back five with wing backs. Then we had Nakamba holding, and then we had two eights. I think it was Barkley and Chong at the um, at the start of the season, and then we had Adebayo and Morris, which you know was the trusted duo that got us to to the Premier League. Powerful, strong, um, real, real athletes, but also both of them are technically pretty decent as well. But then Adebayo is probably not as Premier League ready as Morris. I still think Adebayo's got a big part to play, but um, Ogbené coming in and, and performing the way he did sort of forced it to a, a 3-4-3 or a 5-2-3, um, which I guess left us a little bit short in midfield, um, especially after Lukonga got injured. Um, we started playing Pelly and Nakamba as a midfield too, and you know they've done well, but, but we were overrun in a couple of occasions. Um, so against Spurs to try and combat that for the first half, played a 4 2 3 1, which in my head is the best formation for what we've got. It means you're not really overrunning midfield, you've got a midfield three with, with two eights or two sixes and a, and a 10. Um, but you've also got full backs that can bomb on with, with cover. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different formations being trialed out, um, a lot of different systems that, that Edwards is trying to use to try and find what. I guess sticks, um, which is completely unheard of from from what we seen last season. He had six months where he kept pretty much every fine detail the same and, and won us promotion. Um, but but obviously the Premier League is a is a different beast and you need to combat it in a different way. Yeah. Just before I get like a lineup prediction from you, how how much joy have you had from 
Watford getting rid of Rob Edwards as Watford do these days. I mean, although they, did they have they gave a new contract to, to their latest manager, I believe. That, yeah. I mean, I nearly, yeah. I nearly fell off my chair when I heard that. But <laughs> how, how much joy do you get that Watford got rid of him and then you took him after Nathan Jones obviously took the leap to go to Southampton and then he's got you promoted? Oh, it's, such, it's a brilliant story. It's one of those <laughs> you not write. Um, yeah, it was always a bit of a strange fit when a young up and coming manager that done really well with Forest Green got the got the gig at Watford, who could have promised him absolutely everything, still wouldn't have believed it whatsoever. Um, so yeah, he, he, I can't even say it didn't work out for him at Watford because he was so early into his tenancy. I think it was eight or ten, eight to ten yeah, games. It was and, something ridiculous. Yeah, and they were they were knocking on the door of the playoffs. Um, but Valerian Ishmael, who has been given much longer, has them just outside the relegation zone. So, by all means, give him give him a ten year contract. <laughs> um, so, what's your what's your lineup prediction for Saturday, Billy? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a real difficult one. Um, not knowing who's fit, and I guess that's the same with you with um, with a few players that that might have picked up something during the international break or, or were carrying knocks just before. Still um, got games up going on tonight as we record, yeah. I think, as well. So <laughs> yeah, you're just praying that nothing nothing bad happens. Um, but yeah, I'd go for Kaminsky and goal. We started every game, been brilliant. Um back five is difficult. I'm trying to remember who's fit. It's um quite a difficult game to play. Uh but I'd go with I think Kabore might be brought back into the side. Um I think Reese Burke's fit, and if Reese Burke's fit, I'd play him. Lockyer and Bell at left centre back with Doughty left wing back. Um, and then the two in midfield. I think Barkley might be brought back in, and Nakamba with a front three. I'm still trying to remember who, who I haven't said. Ogbene on the left, Morris down the middle, and Tahif Chung on the right. Right. Okay, that's an interesting one. I think, I think, that, yeah, it's it's a, it's a very mixed kind of side. I mean, kabor has got a lot of pace. I think we looked at him last season to bring him on loan, and, and we never did. Um, ended up getting Aurier, as I said, and he did really, really well. So, what's your score prediction, Billy? Yeah, it's the difficult part now. Um, <laughs> as as confident as I am. Um, yeah, it's more my confidence, more a reflection of what I've seen rather than the opposition that we've come against. So I have to take into account this, you know, rapidly improving Forest side. I've, I'm going to go for one all, just trying to remain confident, but I could quite easily see a, a 2 0 or a 2 1. But yeah, on the trying to be more optimistic and, and provide a different kind of view, I'll go for one all. That's fair enough. I, I, I admire that. So fair play to you. And if anyone wants to check out the Oak Road Hatter podcast, where can they do so? They can on uh, YouTube now. So we do a uh, video recording of using same stuff here. Yeah. Um, and then we're also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your, your podcast from, we're, we're on that. And we'll be recording a Not In For A special tonight. So, uh, yeah, look out for that either tomorrow or the next day. Real. Thank you very much for giving us your time, Billy. We'll we'll speak to you hopefully in the, for the reverse fixture um, when we go to Kenilworth, Kenilworth Road. Um, I would say good luck, but I wouldn't mean it. I say that every time I speak to, to an away fan. So uh, take care and we'll see you in the next one. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans.